hi everyone, this is Nico from the Advanced Imaging Conference in San Jose. And I got to sit down here with Adam Block, an astrophotographer uh, for a little bit here. And why don't you just introduce yourself, Adam? So I'm Adam Block, I'm an astrophotographer. I'm also an instructor in astrophotography. I create instructional videos that show people how to put together the data. And I work at the University of Arizona in the Department of Astronomy doing some research there. So that's basically what I do. Adam gave a presentation called Beauty and the Beholder for the Astro Imaging Channel, which is a weekly uh, talk show on YouTube all about astrophotography. And that presentation really stuck with me. Um, you recommended a number of books. You showed a number of your astro photographs. And um, one thing that I wanted to ask you about it was this concept of pre-visualization. And specifically, where in the process for you pre-visualization arises? There are some kinds of objects that you would take pictures of where they're well-known objects. So you might visualize that, oh boy, I would really like to take a picture of that. It could be a spiral galaxy or some well-known nebula. And you already have in your mind's eye what the ideal version of that is hanging up on your wall or something that you could in some way uh, maybe share with other people, right? Uh, but I think the other form comes a little later where it might be an object that there might not be very many good pictures of or something that you haven't worked on before where you don't really have an idea until you look at the data and you actually examine it and once it's in your hands uh, because there is more information contained in the data that you can display on the screen at any one time. So just by manipulating the screen stretch and starting that process of looking at what you've captured, that informs this pre-visualization uh, pre of the kind of contrast you might want in the final image, the kind of details, the things you need to mitigate, like the noise, stuff like that. And this, I feel, is what uh, Ansel Adams would do, the, the father of pre-visualization, when he would stare through his camera at some scene. He was already thinking about what he was gonna dodge and burn in his laboratory uh, just by being out there in the field and looking at the raw data, if you will. So speaking of Ansel Adams, do you find inspiration in art outside of astrophotography that then um, is directly related to maybe choices you make when you're processing astrophotographs? I think the answer is yes, but it, it's in a surprisingly different way. One of the things that I do as a, um, as a communicator and a, and a public outreach kind of person, uh, popularizer of astronomy, is that I'm always thinking of a way to present an image that offers a perspective. And art does that, right? Art does that by deconstructing things or displaying things or expressing things in a different way that makes the viewer approach the view or think about things in a different way than you might otherwise do. And I do the same thing in terms of astrophotography. So for example, there was a slide that was shown uh, at the end of the presentation that we saw here today uh, by Dr. Plate, which was a picture I took of Betelgeuse, one of the brightest stars in the sky. Now, who would ever stare at Betelgeuse for three hours and just get an RGB image of it, just to see what's there, right? I thought that was a cool idea. I consider that idea just about as good as the final, the picture is, I mean, it's a nice picture, but I think the idea is what really stands out in that picture. And I hope that a viewer would think, wow, you know, I've never actually seen what are the things that are near Betelgeuse because it's so bright. Yeah. Uh, uh, astrophotographers avoid bright stars. They don't go take pictures of them. So uh, that would be an example. Where, where, like, sort of being, straddling professional astronomy and amateur astrophotography, is there anything in the professional realm you think is gonna trickle down there are always things that seem to trickle down. Um, there's some technical stuff, you know, in the, in the days uh, that I recall, for example, deconvolution, right? So de that's the obvious example where uh, the Hubble Space Telescope was producing fuzzy images or you had the atmosphere producing fuzzy images from above, looking down. Uh, there has been this concerted effort to try to do signal processing to make them clearer. Well, that trickles down to software that we all love and use to sharpen our images, right? Uh, but I think that there's, there's other things. Uh, you know, professional astronomers have the same challenge when it comes to showing the public what they're doing. And there are many clever people that come up with interesting ways of doing that. And uh, with my little radar, I'm always on the lookout for 
of how other people choose to express that information or make it publicly available. So, yeah, I look for that as well. One thing you showed in your talk last night was that the air glow in the red spectrum is yeah. really, really bright. It's really bright. So, um, but we don't sense yeah, that. So, so, yeah, but so is that... I mean, I know there's other limitations to shooting infrared from Earth, but is that one of the major that ones? That is a big one. There are certain uh, bands that if you look in, that the air glow is just so bright, you got to, you know, block it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then there's other uh, windows where the atmosphere literally absorbs the light at that wavelength. And so there are small little windows where certain wavelengths come through and others don't. Uh, with water vapor and things like that. So yeah, it gets kind of weird when you start looking at these other wavelengths, how the the atmosphere affects what we see. It just happens to be, well, it's not by chance, but uh, it is transparent at the wavelengths that we are, uh, that we enjoy with our eyesight. On the topic of wavelengths, is there, when you're reading like academic papers on objects, are there any um, wavelengths that a professional astronomer would capture that gives you a hint about something that may be vis visible in the visible spectrum. I think the, the funny thing is that when you look at a lot of the papers, they tend not to have very good pictures. I yeah. mean, right? So uh, it isn't so much, you know, the science that they're doing may or may not inform how interesting the object might be to photograph, but sometimes you can find hints at things because there are papers, for example, where uh, one of the areas of interest is to find uh, stellar streams around other galaxies. And if you look at some old papers, there are hints in some of these old papers, because they're, you know, st people study galaxies, take survey images of galaxies all the time. The star streams were there, but they were just so noisy. I mean, no one would ever think that that was a, uh, you know, a feature that was a, a something to go after. They just didn't have the sensitivity. And it wasn't something they were looking at, right? They looked at the same galaxies. Uh, but later, uh, the study became something that was more significant and important. So you take these uh, deep exposures that can even be done with modest equipment, and now you're detecting uh, stellar streams around other galaxies, which speaks to something about cosmological evolution of the universe. That's cool. That's a great pro-am uh, kind of uh, connective tissue. When you're thinking of the story of an image, are you thinking um, in terms of just the image, or are you also thinking in terms of, and I could verbally explain this based on the image? Do you, do you get what I'm getting at? Like, I, I do. Um, I think for me, the, the, the story is often a perspective, is what I'm trying to show. So it isn't necessarily something that would necessarily need to be put into words. Sometimes it helps, but um, a lot of what an image communicates can be part of the physics of what's going on. So as an example, when you show um, edge-on spiral galaxies, right? If you process the edge-on spiral galaxy, you can make the dust lanes show up very well. But there might be more to it than that in the sense that if you apply too much contrast, those dust lanes become very opaque and difficult uh, to, you don't sense that there's light coming through. Where there is an attenuation of light of all the stars that are in the galaxy, those, that light shines through, right? So part of the story I want to tell is that feature as well. That informs the steps that I'm going to do when I do my image processing is that there may be a perspective here that uh, that I want to express, that I want to be sure that the data, you know, uh, shows me or displays in some way. And that's the story, even, even without words. I think that that's part of the story, that there's a certain naturalness, I think, in that. And that's kind of a, a style that, I, um, that I've generally done with my images through time. And it, it's that kind of thought process I think I use. Um, I'm going to mention a very unnatural photo you showed in your presentation mm -hmm. where you put the, the full moon ah. with the Andromeda galaxy okay. taken on the same night. Very true. Are you worried at all that if that photo circulates on the internet without the context yeah. that people will get the wrong impression? Of course. Yeah. However, I was not the first to make that photo. Sure. That, the first of its type that became popular was done by um, an astronomer at NOAO. And its intent, as was mine, was always to show a perspective. And so the genesis of that 
uh, particular kind of picture was really uh, another one of these perspectives, it was one of scale. It was this understanding of, uh, you know, these objects in the sky, they're so far removed from uh, an understanding of how big they are, how bright they are, how faint they are, all of that kind of stuff. So to put the moon, a half a degree thing, next to the Andromeda galaxy, basically three and a half to four degree thing, really offers some mind, uh, you know, shaking moment of a perspective, even though they don't naturally appear in the sky together because the moon is so bright, because they don't come near to one another, all of that kind of stuff. It is uh, a perspective that was worthy of the misinterpretation. In this particular example, sure, it was worthy because of its uh, intent. Sort of related, um, what is your opinion on narrow band imaging in general? I know that you do mostly, mostly. true color imaging. Do you, what, what and and I want to explain, and I'd like to explain why. Sure. One of the reasons why is because, um, you know, through time, I was always administering these astrophotography programs as part of the public outreach that I did. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, narrow band imaging takes an awful lot of time because you're looking at a, a, a small amount of light yeah. and you got to expose for long periods of time. So that was not amenable to any of the public outreach that I did because you couldn't invest that. No one would pay for that amount of time or spend that amount sure. of time to somehow collect data just yeah. for you know, those purposes. So broadband was an obvious fit for the kind of imaging that I was doing in those programs. Nowadays, there are other sources that I can tap into, uh, remote uh, observing in Chile and uh, other people's data that have been kind enough to give me their data. Things like that become other resources for me. Uh, and it's so recently I've started to actually work with some narrow band data. So I've never been opposed to it, uh, but it is something that is, a, there's a different approach, I think, and it, it certainly has more freedom in the expression because uh, the constraints are relaxed. I mean, yeah. there, there are no longer, you know, you can put things in one channel or another channel. You can uh, manipulate the, the, the contrast or the way in which you uh, might deal with um, just true signal strengths, right? If you did that in broadband imaging, it'd be weird. Yes. Because yeah. you could just make green things, but no, yeah, everyone but it, would look but at Yeah, but in narrow band imaging, we usually boost the O3 quite a bit. Sure. Compared, because the H alpha would just dominate other That's things. right. Yeah. But the story there, then, is really to highlight perhaps the story. I mean, it could be other stories. But for me, the story might be, I want to highlight the physics of where the gas is, right? Mm -hmm. So, And I think that that's generally the convention, is that you're going to offer those intermediate colors or the striking colors where there is this differential in the emission of the gas. And so if the boosting of that signal is necessary to, to highlight those differences, to make that contrast, yeah, that's fair game. Yeah. That makes sense to me. So I don't want to hold you too long, but I want you to uh, tell people on my YouTube about your educational efforts with your website and, and courses. Oh, uh, so I, my site is called adamblockstudios.com. And I really began the work and study and learning of CCD imaging when it kind of just started with amateur astronomy. And this would be in the, you know, the mid 1990s. So in the course of this experience of working with cameras and then working with the data, um, I've I've had the opportunity to experience, you know, a whole uh, set of different software programs, and uh, and then subsequently, because of this experience, you know, create instructional content that helps people to learn how to use the software and learn how to manipulate images and learn just more about astronomy in general. So uh, today, my emphasis is on software programs like PixInsight um, that allows for the creation of these beautiful astronomical images. It's a huge, very sophisticated program uh, that offers uh, many, many degrees of freedom. And so it's ripe, obviously, for this instructional need to explain how to really take advantage of it. Like any other program, like Photoshop has that same kind of need, although it's well covered today. But that one is not uh, dedicated to astronomical imaging where sure. PixInsight is. So that's kind of the niche that I'm currently sitting in right now.